Welcome, viewers and listeners, to the Thinking Fan FC Premier League podcast. Each week, we get together with our besties, who are current pro players, real coaches, academics, and stat eds. Today, I'm joined by soccer analyst Harshel Patel and coach David Seymour. I'm host, Chris Mumford. Bella Ciao. We're sponsored by the Premier League Guide, a 300-page book for those mad about football, Moneyball for Football, Opposition Analysis Plus Eye Candy. The current update is available at www.thinkingfanmedia.com and on Amazon. Match day 28 had some interesting bits and pieces to it. We're just starting to hit the business end of the league, particularly as FA, Europa, and Champions League uh, matches start to stack on top of each other. As far as the weekend starting, we had some interesting pieces in that Newcastle and Aston Villa tied at 1-1. I'm not sure that's particularly dra dramatic, though. I do think there's some thoughts to have on the relegation battle. Leeds and Chelsea um, was a dramatic, uh, energized 0-0. Uh, box to box, there seemed to be a lot of very interesting things going on, though I can't say that anybody really uh, showed exceptional talent in front of um, either one of the, the goals. Um, it was really fun to see that high energy between that, that Chelsea does possess and just that Leeds breathes. Harshal, any thoughts on that match? I mean, you expect that Leeds games are going to be entertaining, but I, I guess it's uh, a testament to the to the the job that Thomas Tuchel's side did in this match. That they that I mean, it was interesting from a tactical point of view. There were quite a few things going on, but it wasn't the end to end um, sort of all action games that we've come to see from Leeds. I think Leeds will be happy that they've managed to keep out Chelsea and secure a point. They haven't. I don't think there have been too many nil-nil draws that they've been part of under Bielsa. So that's obviously um, something that that they will be happy about the fact that they get a clean sheet. Chelsea, on the other hand, it's been very difficult to score against them since Google came in. I think they've only conceded two goals in the in the ten games that um, he's been in charge. Of. So, and it was more of the same here. I. Even though there were a few chances for both teams, both teams hit the woodwork. Tyler Roberts had, uh, you know, forced Edward Mendy into a into a very good save. Um, but it, I, I wouldn't say there were too many clear cut opportunities. They, they were more sort of maybe efforts from range or or, or or goals that would have been considered very good goals had they been scored. Not and not necessarily a case of the striker maybe missing a, a, a clear cut opportunity in that sense. So, it's both teams. I think would be happy with the point. It keeps Chelsea in the top four. Uh, they've been absolutely brilliant. I think since Tuchel took over, they've not lost a game under him basically. So, I I, I don't think they're going to drop out of the top four. They come the end of the season, they, they're definitely going to be in the Champions League spots. It, and I'm looking forward to see how this Chelsea team evolves now under him because it looks like they've got the defensive side of things down very like you know in a very good space but I think Tuchel will want more attacking in Petters and more creativity and he's trying to still find the individuals and structure that can give him that and I also expect to potentially see him move to a back four sooner rather than later he's playing a back three in most games he started with sort of a back four against Leeds but it was a hybrid where it was back three in possession back for out of possession or, and it was sort of moving between those two systems. So it'll be interesting to see how all of that develops. Yeah, I think Chelsea, they've had three uh, draws out of the last five and two wins. So I guess the, the upside is that West Ham and Everton and Tottenham have not really been able to gain on them uh, as they are um, having these draws here. As far as leads go, in some ways, they're able to right the ship. They've had three losses out of the last four, uh, and they were able to secure a, a draw. And Leeds' schedule going forward um, has a couple of um, difficult matches coming up, but for the most part, uh, surrounding that is, is a fair number of the relegation um, zone teams, um, I, would, I would call. As far as 
the next games goes Crystal Palace, West Brom, 1-0 win, where Crystal Palace was able to move up uh, above Leeds. Um, a bit of a surprise, Everton Burnley. Um, Burnley was able to come away with a 2-1 victory, and, and I probably consider that a steal because I, it was um, at Everton. David, what's your, what's your take on that game? Yeah, it was the second Burnley game in the in the last week that I've uh, I've really enjoyed actually. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I took a couple of things from it. I think that it was funny that Dwight McNeil. I mean, he's going to get a lot of plaudits for the goal, and quite rightly. But I think even if you ignore that goal, McNeil was was really good and was at the center of a lot of what Burnley did in attack. And I've been trying to watch more of Burnley recently, and I had a conversation with. A couple of uh, other analysts uh, last week about McNeil and asked for their opinion on him because I, he's, he's highly rated. And I watched him a few times and I just didn't feel like I was getting it. Well, I, I felt like watching him on the weekend, I, I started to see you know why people were raving about him. Um, and the other thing that uh, maybe a controversial take, I really like Chris Wood. I think Chris Wood's a good player. And uh I saw there's a stat. He scored something like one in every three Premier League games, and he looked really good again against Everton. And I wonder if, I mean, I don't want to harp on too much about West Ham, but there's a lot of talk about West Ham trying to sign a second striker to Antonio. They want a physical forward who can run in behind. And I'm watching Chris Wood, and I'm thinking that would be a pretty sensible option. Um, so I enjoyed watching it from that perspective. I think I was obviously surprised by the result. I think we probably all were. A little bit, and um, yeah, I, I mean, as an Everton fan, you'll be gutted to not at least take a point from that game. Interesting. Um, in other matches, Man City beat Fulham pretty handily, three um, zero. Brighton um, ended up uh, winning two one against Southampton. Southampton is seemed like they were about to stop the free fall, but they continue to fall, and and Brighton seems to be picking it up a little bit uh, in terms of trying to ease away from the the, the re relegation vortex. Any thoughts on that match? Yeah, um, Southampton. I, first of all, I think Southampton are absolutely not safe yet because they've been, I mean, they've had a wretched run of form. I think they've won the two of their last 15 or 17 games or something like that. So, And that's relegation form. So, Yes, they have still have somewhat of a cushion in terms of the number of teams and the number of points between them and the relegation zone. But if they continue in this vein, I would not be surprised to see them fall down the table even more. Brighton really needed this win, I think. Um, and they've moved above Newcastle, who they play next. So that Brighton-Newcastle game is going to be massive in the context of the relegation battle. But it was, again, it was interesting that Brighton were able to pull out this win Almost, it was almost a direct result of Graham Potter's tactical changes at halftime, where Brighton started with a back three. Dan Byrne got injured um, just around halftime or before or in the first half. So the second half saw uh, Brighton come out with a back four, but uh, sorry, it was the other way around. They started with a back four with Dan Brown, uh, Byrne at left back, but they came back in the second half with a back three and wing backs with. Andy Zakiri, who is a striker playing at right uh, at left wing back, and Pascal Gross, who's sort of a central midfielder playmaker, uh, playing at right wing back. Leandro Trossard was moved from the left wing into a sort of number ten position with uh, Danny Welbeck up front. Long so that changed the game completely because it allowed Brighton to be able to play through um, Southampton's press in a much better fashion. Potter spoke in the in the post match conference about how he wanted he was using Dan Burn at left back as a direct sort of uh, physical and aerial presence against Kyle Walker Peters, who is the Southampton right back. There's a very obvious height mismatch there, and Zakiri, who's about six foot three, is again has that height advantage over over Kyle Walker Peters, which is why Potter said that that's why he wanted him on the left and. Uh, the changes worked. They were able to play out from the back much more effectively. The second Brighton goal, which was the one that Trossard scored, was up, was very well worked. Adam Lalana played a brilliant pass to Danny Welbeck between the lines who laid it off 
with another brilliant touch to toss out to fire into the top corner so it, it was a good example of how potter's system his tactics his coaching can work but i think um, brighton will need to first survive this season in the premier league before they can maybe look to improve the quality of the squad to match the system that potter's putting in place because i think brighton are one of the be- best teams to watch in the premier league in terms of the way they play their football but they've just struggled with in both boxes basically they've struggled with their defending and they've struggled with finishing off the chances that they've created so if they do manage to survive the season it will be very interesting to see what business they do in the summer to improve the quality of the squad so if we turn our attention to the lester absolute thrashing of sheffield united lester city it's 5-0 David, there's some really bad news if, uh, I, I, for, for most Sheffield United fans. Chris Wilder was let go. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Was that justified or not? It, it's a difficult one because on the face of it, no. Um, despite what's happened this season, when you look at Chris, what Chris Wilder's done at Sheffield, I think the fact that the fans, and it seems to play, the players were very much still behind him, you'd say no. Um, some of the reports that I saw coming out were discussing apparently that the, the owner wasn't overly happy with their summer transfer business and wanted to bring a director of football, which Chris Wilder was against. And that seemed to be the majority of the talk there. Mm-hmm. And in <laughs> it's a that's a difficult one to argue about. And not even necessarily just this summer. There's been some since they've really been in the Prem, they have spent good money on certain players. You can go back to at least Moussa at the beginning of the first season, who was quite good for them in their first year, but certainly hasn't been there this year. But then you look at Rian Brewster, I think it's probably, you know, borne the brunt of that uh, quite a bit. That was a £20 million signing, which which um, didn't really pay off. Uh, I quite like Sander Berger, but he hasn't really hit the ground running. Is that fair to say, Harshal, would you say? He was good when he came in last year. He came in in January last year. He, he had an immediate impact. He's been injured and he's out for the season, I think. So, obviously, hasn't had an impact this season. That's why But I out. think he will be, yeah. And I think he will probably be picked up by a family club in the summer. Another transfer they made, you know, when they came back. Not came back, but I mean, sort of when they got promoted back to the Premier League last year. Oli, they, I think they picked up Oli McBurney from Swansea for around £20 million. Or yeah. so as well, and even he's mm. not really uprooted too many trees in terms of goal scoring. So they they have spent decent amounts of money on certain players who haven't really returned too much. Yeah, I didn't realize that about Berger. Okay, well I'll, I'll retract that one. But then even look at I know that Chris probably isn't a fan of Aaron Ramsdale. I haven't been overly impressed with him in between the sticks. Um, what are your thoughts on Ramsdale, Chris? Um. I am fairly ambivalent about him. You know, I've actually spoken to uh, some uh, scouts and they just, they don't think he, he has what it takes to be in the Premier League and in, in goalkeeping, the margins are just so fine. Um, I don't think he can make a compelling case that he's he's done a fabulous job. He's in the lower tier uh, in terms of uh, preventing goals per 90, um, but not 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 the bottom of the league and in in, from that respect um you know it's it's very interesting to see I, I was kind of hoping that sheffield united was that story where the coach they stay with the coach even when he goes down but this whole sporting director um movement i i generally support and i think that if that is indeed the case it's it's fairly easy to understand why Sheffield United probably wants to go in a different direction. Cause I just think mo- football clubs need to modernize. Um, I will say this though, Chris, is that if you're going to do the director of football, you ideally want to do it when a new coach comes in, because for yeah. that to, for that to work, it needs to be a you know symbiotic uh, relationship where really that foot director of football should be involved with the employment of the coach. And I wonder if maybe that's actually what Sheffield United were potentially angling for anyway. Yeah. Well, we'll never know that piece. Uh, you know, I, I really wonder about Sheffield United, how they, they'll fare next year. Um, but yeah, I just, 
it's it's really unfortunate because I think all of us really got behind uh, that team. It was such a great story last year, and now all of a sudden, it just seems to be absolutely left in in, in tatters. Um, so um, we'll see where we go with that one. Um, let's turn our attention to the North London Derby. Um, that was a uh, interestingly enough, um, Tottenham got ahead 1-0, but Arsenal were able to equalize and go beyond that. Harshel, what did you see in that game that that got captured your interest? I will say that I was a little disappointed that Spurs sort of reverted back to the way they were playing around December of last year, where they essentially sat back, waited for the opposition to make mistakes and maybe get a goal on the counter-attack rather than imposing themselves more on the game, which has given them results as we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Where there's, I mean, yes, obviously, the teams they face are, are nowhere near, I would say nowhere near, but they're not as good as, say, Arsenal on the ball. So it can be argued that maybe Spurs were a little justified in sitting back against Arsenal. But I would personally think that, I mean, Arsenal are still a work in progress. They've just over the last week in the Europa League and in the Premier League, they've conceded goals when the opposition has been pressing them high up the pitch through their own mistakes. So they can still sort of shoot themselves in the foot. And we spoke about that last week. So I don't, I am a little surprised that Mourinho didn't try and approach this game in that manner where they pressed Arsenal high and forced them into making mistakes, which they do make when they're playing out of the back. Um, obviously, well, Arsenal, to be, to be fair, yeah. though, just, just to jump in. Totally agree with what you said about the pressing, but actually, if you look at some of you know Arsenal's maybe uh, lesser results recently, teams have had success against them by letting them have the ball and being difficult to break down. So, but with that mix of intelligent pressing at the same time, I think at the top of my head, I think back to sort of even the City Arsenal game back at, in February or Burnley Arsenal, where Burnley drew one one with them, and I think that like. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't a good performance from Spurs, but I don't necessarily think that I, I don't think the game plan was terrible from Jose. I think the execution was terrible. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I I can agree with that, but yeah, it's it's basically the case of I'm not saying they had to execute the full on high press, but Burnley are the perfect example. I think last week where they were sitting back, but they were choosing their moments to press intelligently, and I think Spurs have the personnel to be able to sort of ex execute that. So that was a little bit disappointing. Uh, obviously, Eric Lamella's goal was fantastic. It's it's one of the, probably one of the goals of the season. You, and it's an interesting um, stat that I saw, not relevant, not exactly relevant to the Spurs-Arsenal game, but I think it was in the Europa League where Lamella played the full 90 minutes, I think, without even attempting a single pass with his right foot. So that tells you how left-footed he is as a player. And even in that situation where he scores with the Rabona, you, you you would think, and I think the Arsenal defence were expecting him to go with his right foot. And that's why he was, I think, able to get the space to pull off that shot because nobody expected him to try and wrap his left foot around his standing leg and, and put the ball in the corner. So that was a brilliant goal. But yeah, I, I think it, it took Lamella getting sent off and Ars and Arsenal scoring from the penalty and Spurs going down to them actually then throwing men forward and having a bunch of chances. Kane hitting the post from a set piece. They created a couple of other pro promising opportunities. So I think, I mean, if they'd chosen to do that earlier on in the game, this Arsenal team isn't exactly a very strong team defensively. So you can get at them. And I think Spurs missed a chance to, to do that in this game. I actually think that, you know, I think that West Ham will cause problems for Arsenal because I would expect West Ham to be defensively organised but press intelligently at times against Arsenal next weekend. So that, I know we'll come to that a bit later, but I just thought I'd drop it in there. Do you think though, sorry, Chris, do you think that um, Spurs, like, I, I don't see them getting rid of Mourinho. I think they're going to have to double down on that because of how big his contract is. They've, they they can't play the way that he, like, he's, he's shown the last few games, yep, yeah, okay, we won't necessarily sit back all the time, but they did do that against Arsenal. And there will be games where, he wants to do that. And I don't think it's possible when you have players like Matt Doherty or Davidson Sanchez. Davidson Sanchez was, was terrible. And yeah, it wasn't a penalty, but it shouldn't have got to that stage anyway. What do you think on that? Either of you. <laughs> you know, I, I 
I'm inclined to agree with you. They're going to have to keep Mourinho um, just because they signed a contract without any outs. Um, I don't think they're going to have a ton of money to go out and, you know, they need, they need goals scored and they need to eliminate mistakes uh, in, in the back line. You know, I, I, I think whenever there's a problem, I tend to go for an, for a aging striker that that's very effective. Like I be fascinating to see a Calvani um, over there um, I, or, or even a Giroux. Um, and I know people would push back and say, wait a minute, they, there's a certain style of play and they won't fit in there. But I just, I, I think people have kind of caught on to the Kane and Sun show and you take either one of those guys out and, you know, with Sun being out for a bit, I, I don't see a lot of good things happening for, for Tottenham. Now in defense of, of, of Tottenham, I do think, you know, Arsenal had 13 shots to Tottenham six total, both only had three shots on target. And as far as XG kind of ended up what the eye test was 1.87 for Arsenal and 0.87 for Tottenham. And I just, I feel like there, there needs to be a carnivore in the box. And I think Calvani is a perfect example of that carnivore um, or Giroud, which can pull folks out of shape and hopefully open up things a little more for, for his son um, or Kane. And I don't think it costs a whole lot of money and it's not certainly not long-term money. So that's probably more of a signing that I would favor. Yeah, that, would be, that would be interesting. I, there, there actually are some quite interesting um, free agents coming up this summer. I think I mentioned on the previous podcast that Jerome Boateng is going to be available on a free. I think that would be a good move for Mourinho and Spurs to bring him in. Um, some of the other ones I thought, okay, that you know that could be interesting. Uh, Ryan Bertrand, Sergio Ramos, um, You've got uh, Musa Morega, who's that that Porto striker who could be worth a gamble as a second striker, as a someone you bring on. And obviously, you've got on the further end, higher end, you've obviously, despite Messi, you've got Donnarumma, um, Alaba, Depay, um, Vijnaldum. So you've got a load of big, big name players available this summer. I wonder if for a team that hasn't got a huge amount of, let's say, transfer capital, um, but maybe could support a bigger wage budget like a Spurs. That might be something they, they look to bring in, maybe two or three. What do you think? Yeah. Um, just to go back to Chris's earlier point, I don't think Spurs maybe need an attacking signing as much because they they basically need someone to play a second fiddle to Kane when he needs to be rested. They have Carlos Vinicius, who's on loan from Benfica at the moment. I, I don't know if that deal will be turned into a permanent one, but they need someone of that profile who's content to sit on the bench and come on and maybe contribute when possible. And yes, if a Cavani or a Giroud can agree to fulfill that role, then that makes sense. But I think the attacking side of things just needs Mourinho to maybe let off the shackles a little bit. Because I mean, if Dele Ali sticks around, you've got obviously Kane and Son, you've got Dele Ali, you've got Giovanni Lo Celso, who's injured at the moment, he will come back and play at number 10 most probably. Lamella, Lucas Mora, Steven Bergwijn. I don't know what's going to happen with Bale, but let's say Bale sticks around at um, Spurs as well. So that's a pretty hefty attacking lineup you have with different profiles of players and people who can come in and you know play a role off the bench, who can be sort of rotated with the main cast. And there isn't too much of a drop-off in quality. So I think the problems with Spurs are one, that I think Mourinho needs to let off the handbrake a little more. And two, that I think they do need to upgrade their defensive personnel. Both their right-backs, I think, are defensive liabilities. Um, probably need an upgrade at centre-back as well. Reguilon is a good left-back. I don't. I, I think he's a very good... And obviously, they have Ben Davies as the more defensive option in that Ben spot. Davies is poor, though. Ben Davies is <laughs> nowhere near that level. Of course, but I'm just saying as a more defensive option than the Guilon. But uh, yeah, they definitely I need. I, I, think think, I, don't think can, I don't think Ben Davies can defend. I, I really <laughs> don't. He, the, the amount of times that he lets his marker go or just doesn't track or whatever. But you said about taking the brakes off or you know letting them loose. If you that I mean, Bale did not track back like at all. Doherty was you know struggling. Um, in, in, yeah. 
that and I think that's the issue with you let them off and th- these are players that aren't going to necessarily track back and you can be almost too top heavy and it was just a it was just a bit of a mismatch with uh, it was a odd, it was an odd performance yeah yeah I I wonder I mean Tottenham's in seventh place now they're tied for fifth or sixth in terms of goals for and they're about fifth or six for goals against. <laughs> so they're kind of where there's there, they they need, uh, they should be if you look at goals for and goals against. And um, I, I don't think that they're one or two moves away from changing everything. Um, and that's probably why they're going to struggle. Hopefully they'll, well, they'll, they'll make it into Europa competition because everyone's, everyone is uh, going to get a participate participation medal for for being in that um and so i do think if you gave them basically other than regular on but you gave them a backup left back and then you just clean house defensively maybe even in the with the goalkeeper i know you're a Lloris fan but i haven't been sold in this season i actually think that that's a team that could do something i mean they might still do something if you told me right now that spurs win the europa league and maybe even spring a surprise against city in the uh carabao cup final i wouldn't be shocked okay well, I guess I guess time will tell on that. Um, let's turn our attention probably to what y'all is going to be y'all's favorite match to talk about, which is Man United and West Ham. Harsha, why don't you take a first cut at that? Definitely wasn't okay. I mean, that's probably being a bit harsh on Man United. I was going to say that it wasn't a great watch, but like on second thoughts, United actually played pretty well in the first half. We were, United were creating chances or, I mean, they were able to get in behind West Ham on occasion, which is something they've obviously struggled with in terms of playing against uh, deep defensive blocks. I thought Bruno Fernandes had a really good game. He did look tired at times, but his movement was really good. He was picking up the ball in tight spaces as he does usually um, and obviously facilitating the rest of United's attackers, of whom I thought Mason Greenwood was the best player on the pitch. He... Um, obviously had, I think, two of the best chances in the game. One the one in the first half where Fabianski makes a brilliant save and then the second half where he hits the post where, that, I mean, he should be scoring, I think. But he had a really good game. He, even though he started at as the centre forward, he was constantly drifting out to the right, picking up the ball and either driving at the defence or sending in, a, in crosses. One of which, again, I think Marcus Rashford should have, should have scored in the first half. He had a free header at the far post and sort of completely chose the wrong option with what type of header to go for and it wasn't even on target. So, I thought United were pretty good. Obviously, just scoring the one goal leaves you open to being counter-attacked and, and conceding an equaliser. But uh, West Ham didn't really... I don't think there was too much that they did in open play. Threatened a little bit here and there from set pieces. But other than that, there wasn't really too much for United to worry about. The only thing that I was a little concerned from a United point of view was that Solskjaer didn't make any substitutions, which I can understand because they're literally, it's it's a long injury list that United, United have at the moment. And this was a crucial game where he needed three points. But the knock-on effect of that could be felt in the Europa League on Thursday, where it's again a very crucial game. United go away to AC Milan. It's, a, it's one all. Milan have the away goal, so United do need to score. Um, and, I mean, Solskjaer has said that he expects a lot of the guys who are injured to be back for that game. So, Pogba, Van de Beek, Cavani, Martial, um, all of them are expected to be back in some form for that game. So, I mean, that that should bring some relief to United. But overall, yeah, pretty happy that we got the win and sort of on the, on the way to locking down second place. David? I mean, obviously, I was disappointed. Um, I think that a lot of the the fallout of the game seemed to be people saying, you know, "Why didn't West Ham give it more of a go?" seemed to be the the phrasing that people went with, uh, which I disagreed with. And it, it was frustrating to watch. It wasn't the most exciting game, but that's kind of I think what we wanted to do. I think if you play open against Manchester United, that's when you're going to allow them to be at their strongest. They've got teams that can really hurt you. Um, if you do that. And so, you know, from my, my perspective, United, you know, probably the best counter-attacking team in the league. And you don't, you don't want to leave space behind. You don't want to allow yourself vulnerable to the transition. So 
I didn't hate the game plan. And if you look at if you look at the score, I mean, we we lost because of an own goal from a set piece. It's very close to getting a really big point away at United. So I don't think it was necessarily the disaster that I think a lot of West Ham fans thought it was. I mean, I think West Ham, what a lot of fans wanted to see us go out there with sort of like a swashbuckling approach. And um, we just don't have the players to to do that. And we, we wouldn't be able to compete with, you know, Manchester United player for player on a much better side than us. Um, I thought it was a good to see Maguire play as well as he did, because I know that there's still a lot of people out there who don't seem to, to think that, He's a top centre back <laughs> somehow, and um, I know a few of my West Ham friends have even been. I, I had a big argument with one of my West Ham friends with him saying that he thinks Craig Dawson's better than uh, Harry Maguire, which I I very strongly disagreed with, and I think that his performance. It's the fee, David. It's the fee. It's the eighty million. It is. It is the done. fee. It is the fee. I've always and I've said that all along. I he was absolutely superb last night. What a, what I mean. What a player. So in the past, I've talked a lot about my disaffection towards teams that park the bus as a, as a tactic. Um, I will say in this circumstance, I totally understand why West Ham did it. Uh, and it, at the end of the day, it took a set piece uh, for Man United to score the goal. Uh, so, and West Ham generally defends very well in those situations. So, I think West Ham did what, what they needed to do. Um, they were probably hoping to nick a point really with the idea of doing their best to stay in contention for a, a Europa slot. Uh, so they're still in, in fifth place now with 48 points. Chelsea's at 51, Everton's at 46. So I still think there's some hope for them to punch above their weight uh, in terms of league standing. Um, as far as Manchester United, my sense was, fatigue, lots of fatigue. I just, I really wonder um, with Milan, who is, has, I think at approximately 25 years old, an average age is one of the youngest in terms of starters of all the big five leagues. It'll be fascinating to see how, how things all play out there. So those formerly injured reinforcements would be much needed um, as we uh, move into the um, matches later this week. So I want to turn our attention a little bit looking forward to, there are going to be some interesting matches uh, coming up, um, some bits and pieces, as we know, uh, a lot of um, Europe action going on. As far as Premier League, uh, on uh, Friday, Fulham will take on Leeds. I imagine Leeds is going to try to look to uh, to buffer up uh, its 12th position and, and, and try to uh, move up a position or two against Fulham. Um, Brighton is playing Newcastle. Um, it's going to have some very interesting relegation uh, implications. And then Aston Villa is going to play Tottenham. Uh, David, any thoughts on where Tottenham goes from uh, from last, you know, from the North London Derby to playing Aston Villa, which I think would be fairly important for them to get into Europa contention. I think I think they calm down. I think they hit the reset button and uh, go again. I think that Villa present a different kind of problem. They're a counter-attacking team, and so we'll wait and see how Jose's uh, approach to that. It could be to give Villa the ball and let them try and work out how to break Spurs down and make mistakes, or it could be Spurs to, to control the game and. Uh, nullify any sort of counter-attacks but we'll wait and see because I wouldn't I wouldn't back uh, Spurs at this rate to go through 90 minutes without making a uh, mistake so but it'll be an interesting game I would rate it unfortunately I think it's going to probably be a 1-1 game uh, you know I just think without Sun it's Tottenham really struggles and that's why I disagree still uh, with with you Harshal I, I think they need they need someone crafty like a Calvani to certainly pick up, pick apart lesser teams um, and then be there someone that can occasionally come up with a big game goal. Um, David, what's your take on West Ham Arsenal? Um, will West Ham be able to regroup and, and how are they going to do against an Arsenal? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that Arsenal revert to being an inconsistent side. Obviously they've, uh, they've got that side to them, but they, they've played, they've played quite well in a couple of recent games. So, 
we'll wait and see. Uh, West Ham, historically, not that you should really look at previous games, but historically West Ham struggle against Arsenal and uh, player for player, Arsenal, despite maybe not being the most impressive team they've ever been, they are still a better team than, than West Ham. But um, I think I think it's easy to, to sort of look at West Ham's recent losses, which against City and United, and sort of feel like, oh, it's all doom and gloom, whereas those games are only losses by one goal. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a really big game for West Ham. I think if we lose this one, then I'll just be very happy with, with top seven. Uh, I think if we win this one, we're right back in that hunt for the, the top four. So it's a really big game for how the rest of the season pans out. Interesting. Let's turn our attention to the FA Cup. Uh, Harshell, I imagine Leicester City and, and Man United is is tops on your list in terms of what you're going to pay attention to. How do you see this game unfolding? It's going to be a tough one because uh, Leicester have done really well over the last couple of weeks, even though they've been missing key players. James Madison and Harvey Barnes are big parts of their attacking structure who they've not had available for the last couple of weeks, probably not going to have available for some time to come, but other players have stepped up. Um, Kelechi Hinacho, who we should have spoken about earlier as well, he grabbed the hat-trick at the weekend and that's now, I think, um, five goals in his last three games for, for Leicester. So he's on a really good run of form and it's interesting to note that Rod, Brendan Rodgers is playing a back three so that he can, I mean, not just because of this, but a big part of that is the fact that he can play Inacho and Vardy together. And Iose Perez sort of played that floating number 10 role behind them against Sheffield United. And the three of them were devastating. I thought Vardy showed another side of his game in terms of turning provider. He ended up with two assists, three if you count the own goal. Uh, and both of them were sort of taking turns to drop off and run in behind. It wasn't always Inacho who was dropping deep and Vardy running in behind. We saw the reverse movement happen quite a few times as well. So it'll be a difficult game for United from a defensive point of view because they do struggle at times against a front two and against teams that have a lot of movement in that area. I'll be interested to see. It obviously, it depends on the sort of team that Solskjaer picks. He'll probably need to rotate a little bit because it's more or less been the same 11 to 13 odd players who've played over the last two, three weeks. So as, as I mentioned earlier, some of those guys who are coming back from injury will be needed in the Europa League game and the FA Cup game. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a tough game. It's I think it's away from home as well for United. It's at the King Power, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it will definitely be a difficult game. And I, I don't really want to make a prediction here because Leicester could easily beat United. Interesting. Um, David, in, any thoughts on the Everton Man City? Matt? Um, no, probably no, no, nothing gra- groundbreaking. I think just on the competition as a whole... Uh, it's you sort of look at the draw and I'm just really hopeful that uh, Southampton or, or Bournemouth can hit some form just in the time uh, for the semi-final because I'd love to see one of those make it through to the final. But um, yeah, nothing, nothing overly on on the individual battles. Okay, um, it's just it's so hard to bet against Man City right now. <laughs> you know, mm. their their second team uh, would probably be a, a top four in the league uh, if, if they had to play them by themselves. Um, how about in terms of, of um, champions league? Uh, you know, the, let's see in terms of the fixtures, Real Madrid, Atalanta, Bayern, uh, Lazio, uh, Chelsea, Atletico Madrid, uh, and then Man City, Montengladbach. Any thoughts on the Chelsea Atletico Madrid game? That's a one zero aggregate right now that, Chelsea has the advantage on. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't see Chelsea throwing that away. Um, I know Atletico have been a little bit inconsistent recently and obviously Chelsea looked just so formidable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I see Chelsea staying through that. And um, I tell you what, they're, they're just in Europe in whole, there are, I think, some very interesting teams left in both competitions still. And I... Uh, I'm actually enjoying the Europa League this season just as much as the Champions League. I don't know how you feel about that harsh show. Um, I absolutely agree. Uh, there are quite a few interesting teams. Um, Rangers, for example, doing really well in mm. the Europa League. They've obviously clinched the Scottish title and Steven Gerrard's doing a fantastic job there. Um, Inter Milan, 
Ob- again, I mean, it looks like they're going to win Serie A and they're going to be a strong force in the Europa League. So absolutely, agree. And, and it's not just this season. I think a lot of people, um, just because it's the Europa League, it's Thursday night football and you're considered to be a weaker team if you're in the Europa League. It's it's considered to be basically the, the unwanted... Uh, whatever unwanted family member of the of European competitions but you can really get some good teams good uh good blend of styles in the in in that competition and we're seeing that this season so yeah both but competitions in, look quite in, interesting Inter aren't in it are they I thought yeah. they yeah they, they went out the Champions League bottom right I think are you thinking yeah. of AC Harshal yeah uh, my yeah, it's Inter's in an enviable position and they can just focus on the league right yeah, now yeah my bad yeah. Well, it looks yeah. like you, you are now, are now in that uh, have that luxury as well now. I guess so. That that's a, I guess that's not something that they would have uh, voted for, but uh, unfortunately, some other folks voted for them. Um, how, how about in terms of the the Milan Man United match, Harshal? Any thoughts on that one? It's again, it's going to be extremely difficult because in the first leg, maybe. And pressed United really well. It, they, they, they laid pressing traps over the, all over the pitch. United struggled to progress the ball. Milan had, I think, some of the best chances in the game. Although United also did have a few chances which they didn't take. But uh, I think it was a real blow to concede that goal right at the end. A 1-0 would have made so much of a difference as compared to a one all, especially because Milan had the away goal. And they're getting back. I think Theo Hernandez is going to be fit to play. Zlatan is going to be back. Um, Hakan Chalanoglu might just be back as well. So a lot of the players who were injured for the first leg are going to be back for Milan. That will probably be the case for United as well. But uh, just it, it, it's going to, you know, and United have done well away from home for the last year, 18 months or so, I guess. But it will be a difficult game. United need to score. I, I expect both teams to score, but uh, I, I, it, it, Milan could easily. Knockout United. I don't. I don't see United playing as poorly as they did in the first leg again. And I actually think I think United will will prevail despite being you know, away from home. I'm inclined to agree. I, I think that uh, that Milan is going to be a team to beat in Europe in 2023. Um, they're probably. You know they they need to fix their Zlatan problem within the next. They maybe they get one more year out of him, but they've got such a dynamic squad um, under the age of twenty six. It's just going to be really exciting to see um, the resurgence of Milan back into European football. Um, so, I guess the key takeaways: we've got a lot of bits and pieces. Some interesting Champions League, FA Cup, Europa Cup. Uh, what's not to ask for? I'm going to hit a slight pause on the Premier League uh, matches, though there's some bits and pieces that are being made up. But we should probably wrap it up here, gentlemen. We're sponsored by the Premier League Guide, Moneyball for Football, Opposition Analysis Plus Eye Candy. The current update is available at www.thinkingfanmedia.com and on Amazon. Please subscribe to Thinking Fan Football Club on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform. Join us next week for our Thinking Fans podcast. For now, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao.